Hello, my name is Jody Jones Bott. I am a parent consultant at the Utah Parent Center. My husband and I are the proud parents of four wonderful children. In this workshop titled Bullying Prevention, Everyone's Responsibility, we will discuss some hard questions like, is your child the target of bullying behavior? Has your child bullied others? Do you worry that your child might be the target of bullying or that perhaps your child might bully someone else? If the answer is yes, you are not alone. According to a survey by the National Crime Prevention Council, we are facing the reality that as many as 75% of children have been victims of bullying during their school careers, and about half of the parents report bullying as no problem for their children. This workshop is designed to introduce parents and professionals to information on the dynamics of bullying, a range of intervention strategies, the role of the school, and Utah laws and policies. Parents can help their children, including children with disabilities, learn effective bullying prevention strategies that can be used at home, school, online, and everywhere. During this presentation, we will briefly mention a number of statistics, laws, resources, and websites. For more details on these items, please see our companion handout or visit the Utah Parent Center website. Let's start by exploring the dynamics of bullying while discussing and defining the following topics. What is bullying? What does it look like? Can it be more than a physical action? Who are the bullies? And who might be most vulnerable to being bullied? At first glance, many people might think it would be easy to define bullying behavior. Their first image of bullying might be of a physically intimidating boy beating up on a smaller classmate. While this is still considered bullying, today parents, grandparents, and professionals need to know that bullying behavior can be much more complex and varied than that stereotype. Because bullying behavior can be broken down into five categories, verbal, physical, social-emotional, sexual, and cyberbullying, it is important to note that harmful bullying can also occur quietly and covertly through gossip, nonverbal messages, texting, or on the internet. Most states have laws that address bullying, but the content of each law varies considerably. However, the actual definitions of bullying are very similar. According to Utah's, school district and charter school bullying and hazing policies and training, it very clearly states that bullying means intentionally or knowingly committing an act that hurts, threatens, harms, or endangers another person physically or emotionally and their property, including cyberbullying, harassment, hazing, and to retaliate or retaliation. Utah State Legislature mandated that on or before September 1, 2012, each school board shall adopt a bullying, cyberbullying, harassment, and hazing policy and stated that the purpose of this rule is to require school districts and charter schools to implement bullying and hazing policies district and school-wide, to provide for regular and meaningful training of school employees and students and to provide for the enforcement of the policies in schools at state level and in public school athletic programs. You can read this policy in its entirety by visiting utah.gov or by following the link on, U on the Utah Parent Center's website. No matter how bullying is defined, children should know this overall basic rule and be taught that if the behavior hurts, harms, or scares them, either emotionally or physically, it is bullying. Now, let's look at bullying versus conflict. In normal conflict, children self-monitor their behavior. They read cues to know if lines are crossed and then modify their behavior in response. Empathetic children 
will usually realize they have hurt someone and want to stop their negative behavior. On the other hand, children without empathy, whose behavior goes beyond normal conflict responses, might think, cool, I have more power, this is fun, or let's see if I can break this kid. Bullying is about resolving conflict. It does not occur between evenly matched opponents. Bullying is about control. Students who bully perceive their target as weaker in some way and usually find satisfaction in harming their targets. The difference between bullying and conflict is important to note because conflict resolution or mediation strategies are sometimes misused in an attempt to solve bullying problems. Conflict strategies can send the message that both children are partly right and both children are partly wrong, or that we just need to work out the conflict between the two of you. These messages are not appropriate in cases of bullying or in any situation where someone is being victimized. The appropriate message to the child who is bullied should be, bullying is wrong. No one deserves to be bullied and we are going to do everything we can to stop it. Some may ask, isn't bullying a simple harmless right of childhood that everyone experiences? It's hard to support that common view when we examine the research about the short and long-term impacts of bullying. No child or person should have to endure being bullied. What impact does bullying have? In a Dear Colleague letter dated October 26, 2010, there is a list of possible effects that come from being harassed and bullied. In the area of education, the impacts can include an increase of school absences, avoidance and dropout rates, a loss of interest in academic achievement and aspirations, and a decrease in grades and concentration. In the area of physical and mental health, the impacts can include troublesome headaches, stomach aches, and sleeping problems, lowered self-esteem, self-confidence, and self-worth, an increase in fear, anxiety, aggression, and self-isolation, and depression or self-harm, such as cutting or thoughts of suicide. As you can see, there are long and short-term negative impacts with varying degrees of damage it can cause. But the most tragic and extreme response to being bullied and harassed are suicides committed by students following bullying situations. Because of this information, we can fully understand there is a critical need for bullying prevention and a range of intervention strategies. Since bullying behavior is broken down into the five categories, verbal, physical, social-emotional, sexual, and cyberbullying, we will take a closer look at each one to understand their dynamics as well as what indicators and red flags to look for. The first type of bullying behavior is verbal bullying. Verbal bullying is the most common type of bullying. The easiest to inflict on other children it is quick and direct and can include teasing and name calling, making threats or intimidating the target, telling demeaning jokes, rumors, gossiping and slandering, and harassment based on sexual orientation. Sticks and stones can break your bones but words will never hurt you. This expression has been passed on from parent to child for generations, and it is part of our culture, but it is also a misconception and a myth too. Children learn at a very early age how to bully other children ver verbally. It begins with unsophisticated name calling, usually using words that adults tell children are forbidden or unacceptable. As children mature, they begin to understand how words can be used to hurt one another. Generally, verbal bullying peaks in middle school and begins to decrease as children become more socially conscious 
and accept the differences of others. It is interesting to note that boys generally like to name call and use threats and girls generally use slander and gossip to gain social power. Because of the dynamics of this type of bullying and considering the age group it peaks with, it is important to distinguish the differences between good-natured fun and bullying. For example, a target of playful teasing reacts with a smile or a laugh. Both parties are building social contact and awareness. The parties are engaged in mutual interaction and have equal power. Whereas, the target of intentional teasing or bullying can become hurt, angry, or sad. The child initiating the action may be familiar with ways to push the buttons of the target. The difference between these acts has to do with the intention of the child initiating the behavior and the reaction of the target. While some teasing may appear good-natured or benign to a witness, in fact, it is hurting the target. The second type of bullying behavior is physical bullying. Physical bullying is usually the easiest type to recognize since it is the most visible behavior and can include hitting, kicking, pushing, spitting, pulling hair, biting, throwing objects, or unwelcome contact, and taking or damaging property. With this type of bullying, there is a perceived intent to harm, which can include instances of pretending to physically harm the target, including flicking fingers at their target, causing their target to flinch, making a slapping motion in the air aimed toward their target, causing a withdrawal with that reaction, or extending hands close to the target's eyes and face, causing the target to move away. Although physical bullying episodes can be brief in duration, they have consequences that extend beyond the immediate hurt or harm. This type of bullying can trigger emotions that cause the target to feel unsafe, even when they are not around the student who bullies. Physical bullying can begin as in children as young as four or five years old. This behavior is not considered bullying until the child realizes his or her actions cause another pain. Physical bullying is more often used by boys against boys, but girls can also be subjected to biting, hitting, and kicking on the playground, in school, and on the way home from school. The third type of bullying behavior is social emotional. Social emotional bullying is the most sophisticated of all types of bullying, and it is generally very calculated and often done in groups, and can include creating a sense of unease, vulnerability, and a lack of safety, alienating or excluding others from groups, clubs, cliques, or activities, purposefully ignoring or giving the silent treatment, spreading rumors, or damaging another's reputation, publicly humiliating others or making fun of them, manipulating or telling others not to play with a certain classmate, and is the most difficult for children to define or recognize as bullying because it is typically not physical. Children may not understand what is happening to them and they may feel as if they have done something to, deser to deserve it. To make matters even worse, social-emotional bullying is generally difficult for the casual observer to detect since he or she does not have full knowledge of the social nuances or social structure surrounding the individuals or behavior. Emotional abuse peaks in middle school when children are experimenting with social boundaries and learning about the power of inclusion and exclusion. Much of this behavior is part of learning about social norms and standards and finding out where one fits in the social hierarchy. The behavior becomes bullying when the intent is to cause pain to someone and to assert social dominance. Girls are more likely to use emotional bullying than boys. 
This is often called relational aggression. The Ophelia Project describes relational aggression as behavior that is intended to harm others. Aggression can take many forms, but physical forms of aggression, like getting into physical fistfights, dating violence, violent crimes, have received the most attention from researchers, educators, and parents, who understandably are interested in protecting their children from the serious harm that physical aggression often inflicts. Please note that emotional aggression and other non-physical forms are just as harmful to a student's ability to grow, learn, and succeed. Emotional aggression encompasses behaviors that harm others by damaging, threatening to damage, or manipulating one's relationship with his or her peers. The fourth type of bullying behavior is sexual. Sexual bullying is often the most difficult for children to report or discuss and can include sexually charged comments, inappropriate or lewd glances, inappropriate physical contact, lewdness or exposing private body parts in a public setting, sexual assault, and any form of technology or electronic device used to hurt or attack another with any sexual content. Even though this subject may be uncomfortable to talk about, children and youth need to know acceptable boundaries and appropriate behavior in social relationships. All children and youth, including those with disabilities, need to be provided with the appropriate social rules and norms for dating and flirting so they can act with respect toward their peers and be able to recognize when someone is not respecting them sexually. Furthermore, they should know the answers to questions such as, is it okay to touch a girl's shoulder when you're talking to her? And is it okay to talk with an older boy? as well as know the answers to questions such as, what can I do if someone tries to kiss me? And what should I say if someone tells a dirty joke? For guidelines on acceptable behavior within a school, parents can consult their child's student handbook for the school's written policy. The fifth type of bullying behavior is cyberbullying. Cyberbullying is the use of technology to harass, hurt, embarrass, humiliate, or intimidate another person, and has been referred to as the new bathroom wall because it is a place for children to post mean and inappropriate comments and can include any technology or electronic device used to send or post text messages or images intended to hurt or embarrass another person, emails, or text messages that include lies, threats, gossip, sexual harassment, hate speech, or ridicule others. Posting or releasing someone's personal information such as name, address, grades, pictures, or school. Or encourages others to electronically pass on hurtful information. According to the Pew Internet and American Life Project, 93% of teens between the ages of 12 and 17 go online. 63% of those report that they are online every day. Cell phone ownership has also increased dramatically from 45% in 2004 to 71% in 2008. Teens frequently communicate through a variety of electronic sources, including text messages, cell phone calls, social networking sites, instant messaging, and emails. Along with the increase in technology use, there has been an increase in cyberbullying. Youth between the ages of 10 and 17 who indicated they had been involved in cyberbullying in 2005 was 50% more than what was reported in 2000. Cyberbullying is extremely dangerous and damaging to both parties. Because what was once a behavior restricted to the schoolyard and neighborhood has now gone viral. 
Some concerns associated with cyberbullying include a potentially unlimited audience. It can be done anonymously, not having to face the target. Children using technology often lack impulse control. Youth are likely to own and use cell phones, computers, and other electronic devices. There is a great lack of adult supervision. Internet hotspots can be found just about anywhere. Children often don't realize that once something is posted, it can stay out there forever, 24-7, and there is no getting away from it. Bystanders and witnesses to cyberbullying are anonymous because they view the harmful material on a website and don't deal with it in person. And youth may be reluctant to report cyberbullying because they fear adults will limit their access to technology. Cyberbullying can begin as early as when students first get access to technology. According to research, boys are more, more likely to post mean photos or videos, and girls are more likely to spread rumors or post mean and hurtful comments. Here is a short video on cyberbullying. The phenomenon of electronic aggression or cyberbullying, as it tends to get called, is something that's really terrifying to a lot of kids and a lot of parents. Because as awful as in-school bullying is, a kid can at least know that when they go home, the bullying will stop. With electronic aggression, the bullying never stops. It happens 24-7. So a lot of parents are wondering what they can do about it. And the fact is, you can't make the technology go away. So what we have to do is teach young people responsible use. Something happens when kids get behind a computer screen when they engage in behaviors that they would never engage in face to face. What we need to help them understand is the impact of those behaviors, which is just as negative when it happens online as when it happens face to face. The fact of the matter is most kids think what happens online stays online, sort of like what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, but they don't understand that that isn't the case. So teaching your kid responsible use is critical. Knowing where your kid is is critical. Does your kid have a Facebook or MySpace profile? The fact is we would never let our kids run around on the weekends and have no idea where they are. Why do we let them run around online and have no idea where they are? And finally, for a lot of parents, they're really afraid because they don't understand the technology as well as their kids. Well, guess what? You're never going to understand the technology as good as your kids because they've grown up with it. That should not be a problem. The real issue here is not technology, it is communication. And if you have a good relationship with your kids and you could talk to them about appropriate versus inappropriate behavior, you can easily translate that to appropriate versus inappropriate online behavior. So don't worry if you don't know how to set privacy controls on Facebook. Lord knows I don't. But I know how to talk to kids. If you know how to do that, you're going to be okay. Now, let's talk about who bullies, who gets bullied, and why. Traditionally, bullies have been perceived as someone large in stature. In reality, bullying is defined by his or her behavior. Bullies can be any size, race, religion, or gender. They can be popular, or they might have been rejected by the in-group or social circles at school. It is a misconception that all students who bully have low self-esteem. While some bullies may have a low self-esteem, Many students who bully actually have a high self-esteem. Bullies can often be the students who are popular, smart, charming to adults, and skilled at recognizing and understanding social cues. Bullies may often appear to have a large circle of friends, but after a closer look, most have chosen to be a friend to the bully because they fear becoming targets themselves. What characteristics do bullies share? They have a powerful feeling of dislike or contempt towards someone else. They consider their target worthless, inferior, or undeserving of respect. They have a sense of entitlement. They thrive on control and dominance. They are intolerant of differences in people. Often, they cannot distinguish between fear and respect. And a typical common denominator among children who bully is that they lack empathy for those they target. Why do children bully? 
Some powerful reasons might include, it makes them feel more confident. They seek to demonstrate power. They like to feel in charge. It helps them feel connected and valued by others. Or they may have been bullied themselves. Who gets bullied? Research gives us some insight into who is targeted by bullies. While there is no typical profile of someone who might be subjected to bullying, there are some common characteristics that leave children at risk and vulnerable to bullies. Bullies recognize these vulnerable characteristics and target these children. Common characteristics of someone who gets bullied might include struggling with the ability to defend themselves, providing emotional reactions to being bullied, such as anger, fear, or crying, having few or no close friends and peers, being socially isolated, avoiding being noticed, having underdeveloped social skills, having difficulty communicating, and struggling to read social cues, especially nonverbal cues. In one research study, students were asked to share why they thought they were bullied or mistreated. They were allowed to choose more than one reason. This is a chart that represents the students' responses. The chart indicates that appearance, looks, and body shape were most often stated as reasons for the focus of bullying. Other common reasons include race, sexual orientation, religion, family income, and disability. Can someone be the target of bullying and also be a bully? Yes, there are children who play a dual role. This is referred to as reactive bullying. Reactive bullying is defined as a student who is targeted by bullying and who also bullies in response. Common characteristics of the reactive bully can include acting impulsively, reacting quickly, physically fighting back, taunting the person bullying them, and struggling to comprehend social norms. What about children with disabilities? The reality is that children with disabilities are significantly more likely to be bullied. According to research, 60% of students with special needs report being bullied compared to 25% of the general student population. Children with special needs or a disability are 10 times more likely to be bullied than a typical student. This is alarming considering the current federal statistics show that 15 to 25% of typical school-age children are bullied with some frequency and 40% of children with autism and 60% of children with Asperger's syndrome have experienced bullying. Students with disabilities might experience unique bullying styles based on their perceptions of social norms and skills. Bullying a student with a disability can include manipulative bullying, such as when a student attempts to manipulate, force, or control another student. Conditional friendship, such as when a student pretends to befriend someone only to bully them instead. Exploiting bullying, such as when a child's disability becomes the subject of the bullying. This can occur in person through technology, such as social media and networks. Let's look at some examples of disability harassment in the schools. In the first situation, several students continually remark out loud to other students during class that a student with dyslexia is retarded or dumb and deaf and does not belong in the class. As a result, the harassed student has difficulty doing work in class. Her grades decline and so does her self-worth. Another example is of a student who repeatedly places classroom furniture or other objects in the path of a classmate who uses a wheelchair, impeding the classmate's ability to enter the classroom as a result, the student is late, feels embarrassed, and is teased. In the third example, 
a teacher repeatedly subjects a student to inappropriate physical restraint because of conduct related to his disability. As a result, the student tries to avoid school through increased absences and the behavior increases. We need to stop all of these types of bullying from happening. What can parents do? What works to prevent or stop bullying? Research suggests that the best way to deal with bullying is through comprehensive programs that focus on changing the climate of the school and the social norms of the group. For more information, see the stopbullying.gov website. It is important to know what parents and others can do to prevent or stop bullying. Parents are encouraged to recognize that there is not a one-size-fits-all solution. Your child is an individual, so your response to bullying should be individualized to fit your child's needs, skills, and situation. There are several important steps that parents can take. The first step is to know the laws. Most states have laws that address bullying in schools, but the content of each law varies considerably. Some of the laws are very detailed and address a variety of elements, while other laws are brief with minimal definitions and requirements. An interactive map from the stopbullying.gov website contains information on each state's bullying and harassment laws. Utah's state laws cover a large range of topics for bullying, harassment, and hazing. If the bullying or harassment denies a student with a disability an equal opportunity to education, then Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act and Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act apply. We just gave a few examples of bullying in the classroom. These types of situations would be covered under Section 504. Another law, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, or IDEA, was enacted to make sure that students with disabilities get appropriate special education and related services, allowing them to access and benefit from public education. If harassment and bullying based on disability is consistent, severe, or escalating, it may cause negative feelings such as fear or anxiety. These feelings and fears may lead to a student not being able to concentrate or learn and in some cases, it may even affect the, the child's school attendance. IDEA applies when there is a denial of a free, appropriate public education, or FAPE. Remember, if a child is unable to benefit from or have access to his or her education, it might amount to a denial of FAPE. Like Section 504, IDEA guarantees students with disabilities the right to FAPE and provides remedies if the child does not receive FAPE. The second step is to keep a record because if it is not in writing, it doesn't exist. When a child is a target of bullying, parents need to document the events and develop an ongoing record or history of what is happening to their child. A record is useful when talking with educators, law enforcement personnel, or other individuals who may need to assist with intervening against the bullying. Parents should do their best to keep an unemotional record of events. By doing this, emotions alone do not drive the discussion. Documentation and data collected should include the date and time of the event, all individuals involved and any witnesses, your child's account of the event, any communication with professionals, teachers, administrators, etc., the time and date of the communication, a summary of the event or the discussion, all responses and actions taken by professionals, as well as any reports filed by the school 
in accordance with the school district policy or state law. Other good forms of documentation can include pictures taken of the child after a bullying incident to document any physical evidence, doctor's records or other healthcare records to indicate evidence of bullying, or tape recordings of the child talking about the bullying. Records can help parents keep a concise, accurate timeline of events. Parents may think they will remember the details later, but it is much easier to refer to a written record than to try to recall all the specifics of these events later. The record can also help in determining if the bullying behavior has increased or decreased in frequency or duration. The record should be factual and based on actual events. Do not add opinions or emotional statements. It is important to always keep a copy for your personal record. And remember, if it's not in writing, it does not exist. The third step is to notify the school. It is important for parents to notify the teacher, school administration, and all team members working with you each time your child reports being bullied. It is important to document your notification and contact with the school and others. There are several ways to make this communication happen, such as in person, by the phone, writing a letter, or sending an email. Written notification can serve two purposes. First, the letter or email will alert the, the school administration to the bullying and your desire for interventions against the bullying. Second, the letter can serve as your written record when referring to events. Your written notification can be in any format and as a support to parents and others reporting the bullying, the PACER Center has created three letters that may be used as a guide for notifying the school in writing. These letters contain standard language and fill in the blank spaces so it can be customized for your child's situation and are available on the PACER Center website. The first letter, notifying school about bullying, is a general letter for anyone to use. In addition, the PACER Center also offers two additional letters. The second letter, student with an IEP, notifying school about bullying, is for parents who have a child with an individualized education program, or IEP. And the third letter, student with a 504, notifying school about bullying, is for parents who have a child on a Section 504 plan. Let's talk about a few things that parents can do to help children deal with the bullying. Parents, talk with your child. Some children are able to talk to their parents about personal matters and may be willing to discuss bullying. Other children may be reluctant to speak about the situation. To help you communicate with your child, consider the following suggestions. Listen. It is your child's story. Let him or her tell it. Believe. React in a way that encourages your child to trust you. Be supportive. Empower your child and tell them it is not their fault and that they do not deserve to be bullied. Be patient. Talking about the bullying may be difficult and children may not be ready to open up right away. Provide information. Educate your child about bullying by providing information at a level that your child can understand. And explore options. Discuss with your child the options that they may have to deal with bullying behavior. Parents, prepare yourself. When parents discover their child is being bullied, they may feel a variety of thoughts and emotions such as, disbelief that someone would harm their child. I feel terrible that I didn't know. Fear for their child's safety and sadness in not having protected their child. I don't understand why this is happening to my child. Bewilderment and guilt 
at why they or someone else had not recognized the behavior earlier and done something to prevent it. I wish I had done something sooner. Anger against the person who is bullying their child or his or her parents and the school. I am so angry. Or feeling victimized and powerless to help themselves or their child. I feel so helpless. These reactions and emotional responses are normal and natural for parents. It is important for parents to recognize and acknowledge their feelings and reactions, but remember to focus on the issue, not on the emotions. Parents, encourage self-advocacy. It is important to encourage your child to be a self-advocate and involve your child in deciding how to handle the bullying. By involving your child in the decision-making process, it will provide your child with a sense of control over the situation. It will show them that you are willing to listen and take action. It will reassure your child that his or her opinions and ideas are important. Parents, create a student action plan with your child. A student action plan includes three simple steps that provide the opportunity to explore specific actions that address the situation. First, define the situation. Second, think about how the situation can be different. And third, write down the steps to take action. Student action plan booklets are available at pacer.org. Parents, plan to protect your child online. Technology offers your children many advantages and benefits and occasionally some risks. The solution is to manage these risks, not remove your child's access to technology. Children have rules, curfews, and guidelines when they go out into the world. They also need to have them in the cyber world. You can protect your child by being aware of your child's cyber activities, learning about new technology, and setting rules for your child's online use. Consider the following tips. Raise the topic of cyberbullying with your children. Open the subject for discussion and let your child know that you want them to use their phones, computers, and to be online with their friends. But just like in school, they deserve to be safe from being bullied online and should not bully others. Let your child know that if something is happening online that is hurtful to them, that is bullying, and it is important that they let you know. Set cyber safety rules. For example, teach your children don't say anything online that you wouldn't say or do in person. Don't reveal anything online that you wouldn't tell a stranger. Never give out any of your passwords or usernames except to your parents and other appropriate adults like a teacher. Never share personal details like your last name, phone number, address, photos, or other things without your parents' permission. Keep computers in open areas of your home, such as in a family room where internet activity can be supervised. No computer use or texting is allowed after 9 p.m., during meals, or until homework is done. If you discover that your child is experiencing cyberbullying, document it by printing the emails or web pages, saving electronic copies, and contacting your child's school or the police. Did you know that bystanders may be the most important bullying strategy we have? It is estimated that 10 to 25% of students are bullied and 10 to 25% of students bully. This leaves us approximately 50 to 80% of students who have the potential to witness bullying. These witnesses are known as 
bystanders. Bystanders who witness bullying impact the situation in powerful ways because they often influence the situation with their actions. Some bystanders act in a positive manner and are helpful, while others can sometimes negatively contribute to the situation. The following information on bystanders comes from Eyes on Bullying website. Helpful bystanders are people who directly intervene, defend the victim, distract the bully, or report the bullying. While hurtful bystanders are people who encourage the bully, laugh, cheer, or support the bully, join in the bullying, or silently accept the bullying by doing nothing. Take time to be an educated and active bystander and teach children to be educated and active bystanders by following these few simple steps. Spend time with students who are all alone or bullied. Try to distract the situation or get the student being bullied away from the situation. Listen to students who are bullied and tell the student that no one deserves to be bullied. For additional information about bystanders, watch a short video called The Role of Bystanders by Kevin Jennings on the Pacer Center's website. It only takes one person to make a positive and lasting impact in the life of someone who is bullied. Be the change that you want to see in the world. We can teach our children that bullying prevention is everyone's responsibility. Thank you for viewing this presentation. We hope you have found something that was interesting to you and that you will be able to use this information to help create a world without bullying. For additional information on any of the topics we have talked about, please refer to the companion handout, additional resource information sheets, and links provided on the Utah Parent Center website, which is www.utahparentcenter.org. You may also contact the Utah Parent Center to receive printed information or talk about your situation with one of our parent consultants. The Utah Parent Center, or UPC, is a nonprofit organization that provides free services throughout Utah because each parent consultant at the UPC has at least one child with a disability, we utilize a proven and effective parent-to-parent -parent model. Our services include one-on-one -on -one consultations, providing information, support, and referrals, presenting workshops and conferences, offering online training resources, sending out an electronic newsletter, and much, much more.